Please be seated. Why is it that Jesus' voice is so powerful after he returns from the wilderness? In order to answer it, we must ask the equally important question. In the first place, why did he go to the wilderness? What was that experience which made his voice so powerful, his teaching so beautiful and challenging? It is almost like a mathematical equation. Uh, in school, I'm not sure if everyone liked maths. For us, it was a torture, at least for me. But it's worth having a look at a very simple equation with one variable or one unknown in it. In an equation with variables on both sides, the unknown quantity, usually expressed by a letter such as x, appears on both sides of the equation. To solve this type of equation, we usually try to isolate the variable on one side by manipulating the equation until we have only one instance of the variable. For example, in the equation 2x, 2x, 2 times x plus 3 equals x plus 7. So we can see that there are two x's on one side and one x on the other side. We can subtract the x from both sides to isolate the variable on the left side, so in the second step, when we remove one x from both sides, where there were two x's, there remains only one x. On the other side, where there was only one x, it it's only seven, so x plus three equals seven. Then we can subtract three from both sides to find out that x equals four. So if we put four in place of x, four plus three equals seven. Why this example? Because one would think that the experience of Jesus was his temptation that at the core of his 40 days in the wilderness is his temptation by Satan, the Satan's work. However, it turns out that at the heart of Jesus' temptation, at the heart of our equation, as it were, we find not the experience of temptation, but the experience of his father's love. In our life, that X can mean lots of things. Joys, but mostly tribulations, challenges, pains, anxieties. When we subtract that X, when we remove it, we are left with the father's love. It is this love for Jesus at the bosom of the Father which makes his teaching so powerful. It is this very experience of his, of love, divine love, which prompts our conversion. The first Sunday of Lent calls us to conversion, to share Jesus' experience of the Father's love. We are called to enter this positive center, which sustains and motivates our conversion, our intention that in this land 
we would like to become a better person. Where can we share this inner journey of Jesus? To use our analogy again of the equation, one would think that it is the wilderness, that we have to face bravely trials and enter into the challenges or pains of our lives, and there are plenty of them. But it turns out but that it is something surprising. The experience at the heart of Jesus' temptation in the wilderness, as mentioned, is the experience of the Father's love. But where can we experience it? Here, in the Last Supper, which we remember in every Holy Mass. Is it possible? What do we see in our liturgy? What do we see normally in our Sunday worship? How do we receive the communion? Usually we pay attention to the ritual, or we are so much part of it that we just take it for granted and we go through the motions of the service. There is the altar, important, we know, we are sitting on our chairs, then we go to the altar to receive the Holy Communion. The first Sunday of Lent invites us to see, to meditate on how it really happens. And I'd like to bring the image from our Lenten book, from the first chapter. Those of us who ordered it will find it lent with the beloved disciple by Michael Marshall. We find it in the paragraph entitled The Seating Order, How the Apostles Sat in the, uh, in the Last Supper. Our meditation in that book says that we must forget most of the paintings, what is called the Last Supper. In it, Jesus, together with his twelve disciples, is seated upright, just as we are sitting on our chairs, Jesus in the center, and his disciples similarly seated on either side. In the East at that time, rather than seated at a table, the guests would have been resting on couches, reclining on their left side and leaning on the left arm. So right now, just imagine yourself and ourselves surrounding the altar on a flat, big bed or surface and just lying forming a circle. Left hand, we are holding our heads. With the right hand, we are reaching out for our communion bread or the chalice. In this position, we can say that people are reclining in front of each other's chest. Just like John is reclining in the Last Supper in the bosom of Jesus, almost between the shoulders of Jesus. So you can see that um, if we had the Eucharist in this way, it would be a far more relaxing service. Because when are we reclining? We never do it with colleagues in the workplace, but we do it with our children when they are young, or with our grandchildren. And it creates a totally positive, different dynamic. Intimacy, friendship, when we can feel the other's company. The events in the desert reveal what John's Gospel says 
in the very first paragraph of his gospel. No one has ever seen God. It is only the Son who is close to the Father's bosom who made him known. So we are reclining in that very same way as the Apostles did in the Last Supper. We are reclining as beloved disciples between Jesus' shoulders right in front of his uh, bosom. Just as Jesus is close to his Father's bosom, that's why he can reveal the Father's love to us. This is the only way we can come to know God. As the Father makes himself known through the one who enjoys intimacy of a heart-to-heart -heart relationship with himself, so in a similar fashion, only those like the beloved disciple who have such a similar heart-to-heart -heart relationship with the Son can make Jesus, the Christ of God, known to the world. As Oregon, the great Bible scholar, put it, nobody can really understand the gospel, this gospel, unless they too have lain upon the breast of Jesus. So the var variable of the equation of Lent, the unknown X, is this inner journey this closeness to the Son of God. We are called to imitate Jesus' own abiding at the Father's heart. And everyone is given this offer. Everyone. Baptized, non-baptized, confirmed, regular church attenders, those who don't come to church. Everyone is called to this experience. Those who accept this call, they embark on this journey with Jesus. And those who refuse this offer, they are left with only one option, to continue their journey externally, because all of us are journeying, no one is idle. So those who refuse this offer to enter to the Father's bosom, they, have, they are left with the only option to invest their life energies into external actions, into wealth, power, money, pleasures, meaningful or less meaningful activities. But they remain outside. And they are left only with this world's offers. All what Satan can offer included as a temporary goal. So we are like the first two disciples, John and James. Master, where do you live? Where do you abide? And just as they chose Jesus, because they were in some way disillusioned with what their conventional religion offered, they followed Christ. And if you order the book, or if you look up last week's homilies, I think on Wednesday or Thursdays on YouTube, please read the prologue to this book. It's about how the first two disciples joined Jesus. And the point is there that they spent time with him at his bosom, experiencing the Father's love. And they recognized that Jesus is not simply a rabbi, an important teacher, but the Christ 
of God. The Christ of God. So let us ask humbly the strength and commitment to experience the inner journey with Jesus that we could meet him, love him, and know him, not simply as an important teacher, but the Christ of God. Because he is the only one who can take us to the Father's bosom. He is the only one who can remove from the equation of our life that painful, hurting, X to experience the full joy of Jesus with which his Lenten journey and our Lenten journey began.